Hello everyone, my name is Guillermo Guadarrama Mendoza. I'm currently teaching at the Universidad Iberoamericana Puebla in Puebla City, Mexico. My conference entitles uh, An Ecological Messiah, Reading Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind Through the Theory of the Marvelous and Timothy Morton's Concept of Agrilogistics. This conference explores Hayao Miyazaki's film Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind from the perspective of Timothy Morton's dark ecology, specifically through the concept of agrilogistics, as well as from Omar Nieto and Juan Pablo Morales Triguero's theories of the fantastic and the marvelous literatures. While a synthesis of these two theories enable a deep comprehension of how the human and non-human worlds are codified in the film's narrative, Morton's dark ecology allows us to read such worlds from an ecocritical perspective. Miyazaki's world-famous film has often been read as pro-environmentalist narrative as the main character Nausicaa achieves the reconciliation between the human world represented by the Valley of the Wind and the non-human world represented by the toxic Fukai. However, this conference explores whether the film actually presents an ecological alternative of coexistence between humans and non-humans or if it rather represents a reestablishment of the human normal world maintaining thus the boundaries between them. First, a theory of the marvelous as a textual system is developed, departing from Nieto's general theory of the fantastic and Morales Trigueros' category of the marvelous. Then this theory is deployed to analyze the way in which the ordinary and the extraordinary are codified in the film. Afterwards, more than dark ecologist concepts associated to agri-logistics are applied to develop an ecocritical analysis. In the last section, conclusions are presented. First, the marvelous as a textual system. In his work, General Theory of the Fantastic, from the classic to the postmodern fantastic, Mexican novelist and literary theorist Omar Nieto argues that the fantastic is not a genre, but a literary system, which consists on the introduction of a strange element that invades a quotidian order represented in the text. After this last one has been set up in motion as a background for the development of the narrative. For Nieto, such a strange element is always a materialization of otherness, so the fantastic system evidences a dialectical relation between the quotidian and the strange. Nieto develops his theory of the fantastic after concluding that neither the presence of an illegally strange element nor the text experience of the reader are adequate parameters to define the fantastic. For him, in defining the fantastic according to a predefined list of elements considered beforehand as strange by a critic, there's a begging the question problem. The critic argues that in fantastic stories, such or such creature, theme or topic considered strange appears. Then he finds a text in which such strange creature, theme or topic does indeed appear, after which he concludes that the text is fantastic. On the other hand, the idea that the fantasticity of a text comes from it provoking hesitation on the reader faces the problem of proving that the reader does actually experience the text in such a specific way, knowing that, on the one hand, a reader coming from a cultural background alien to the one of the texts might have a very different reading experience of it, and on the other, that the, reader, that the reading experience can be objectively measured, and thus, whether a text provokes hesitation or not in the reader, can be objectively proven. Therefore, for Nieto, the fantasticity of a text must be looked for in the formal traits of the text. Fantasticity is produced, Nieto argues, when a writer consciously applies a specific textual strategy. The codification of an element as ordinary, then of another element as extraordinary, and after these codifications, these elements are set in opposition and conflict. The outcome of the conflict being the crisis of the paradigm according to which the ordinary was codified as such. It is important to underline that the paradigm in question is not that of the reader, but the one by which the writer codified the elements in the text. The concept of paradigm and the role it plays in the dynamics of the fantastic system is key to Nieto's theory, since it implies that reading and studying the fantastic as a literary phenomenon allows us not only to analyze and comprehend specific works, but also the paradigm underlying what they present as ordinary and extraordinary, that is, what they present as sameness and otherness, as normal and strange, as civilized and barbaric, and so on. Departing from this point of Nieto's theory, I'd like to recover Morales Trigger's category of the marvelous, to put them in conversation and develop a theory of the marvelous in Nieto's terms. In synthesis, for Morales Trigger's The Marvelous Works, 
the same way as Nieto's Fantastic, but it has a different outcome. It is a textual system where an element is codified as ordinary, another as extraordinary, and the two of them confront each other, setting conflict. But in The Marvelous, the outcome is not the crisis of the paradigm organizing the ordinary as such. Rather, Morales Trigueros argues in The Marvelous that, uh, open quote, reality is effectively transformed in a way that what was known about it becomes suddenly invalidated or at least incomplete, close quote. But unlike in the fantastic, it, uh, quote again, it says something about the untold. It neutralizes it, the extraordinary, by telling it and it explores it, close quote. Taking Morales Trigueros' idea and translating it into, into Nieto's terms, we could say that the extraordinary element gets assimilated by the ordinary through an enlargement of the paradigm which codifies it by telling it it explores it. In other words, the laws of the paradigm codifying the ordinary element are transformed or modified so that it can encompass at least part of, if not all, the extraordinary. So how can we use this to read Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind? Uh, second point, reading Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind through the Marvelous System Theory. Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind is an anime film directed by Hayao Miyazaki and released in 1984. The movie narrates the feats of a girl called Nausicaa, who is the ace wind rider and princess of a small kingdom called the Valley of the Wind, as she struggles to avoid, through compassion, the destruction of her world by war and ecocide. The events unfold in an alternative world a thousand years after a catastrophe called the Seven Days of Fire, which eradicated an ancient and highly technological technologically developed civilization. So in the film, humans, like the inhabitants of the Valley of the Wind, are the descendants of this destroyed civilization and strive to survive in a polluted world dominated by the Fukai, a toxic ecosystem in constant expansion. In the movie, the Valley of the Wind works as an ideal normal world for the human characters. This has been studied before by authors such as Victor Eichmann, Mark Hairston, and Pachawaran Bumpronkul. This last one, for example, argues that the Valley of the Wind is modeled after an ideal pastoral agrarian community, while the Fuka is modeled in opposition to it as an alien toxic world. If it is so, this allows us to read the Valley of the Wind as a place or world codified as ordinary according to what's normal for the humans in the film, while reading the Fuka as the extraordinary world. In this screenshot, we see the Valley of the Wind as, an, uh, as a pastoral environment, and in this other screenshot, we see the Fukai as the extraordinary environment. We can see that it is inhabited by bugs and fungi, and that Nausicaa needs to wear a mask in order to be safe from the ecosystem's toxicity. As mentioned before, the paradigm codifying the elements of a narrative has to be found in the narrative. In the case of the value of the wind, it is clear that the reality represented in it obeys certain rules the ones of the scientific paradigm. We can see this in the film. Even though there are many elements in the value of the wind which we as audience, as readers, could interpret as marvelous, there are no supernatural phenomena and there is no magic, at least in the film. If Nausicaa can fly, it is because she has a technological device that allows her to do so on a quotidian basis. If she can appease wild giant insects, it is because she knows the techniques to do it. If there's a giant, that it spits atomic rays, it is because it was engineered by an ancient, highly technological civilization, and so on. The value of the wind is then codified as an ordinary world where humanity can survive in opposition to an extraordinary toxic world which constantly threatens it and its inhabitants, either in the form of illness, giant bugs, or toxic spores carried by the wind. We thus have these two worlds in conflict and constantly transgressing each other, which uh, the, then let us see that the film is working according to the system described by Nieto, at least in the beginning. Up to this point, the textual system can either develop uh, the narrative into a fantastic or a marvelous outcome. Nausicaa, however, is a marvelous narrative insofar as the protagonist achieves an enlargement of the paradigm organizing the ordinary world through scientific inquiry. In the film, we see Nausicaa has a botanical garden where she grows the fungi from the fukai, testing and controlling their soil and water as experimental variables, that is, she carries on experiments. This way, she discovers by deduction that the fungi are not toxic per se. They are toxic because 
because the soil, water, and air are polluted. That is, she develops a hypothesis through observation. In this screenshot, we can see Nausicaa collecting a fungi spore with a test tube, something which suggests she is, she is conducting some sort of scientific research or she at least has scientific practices. In this screenshot, we can see Nausicaa in her botanical garden, along with Jupa, another character. As it can be seen, there are test tubes, as well as a book and writing devices on the table, which once again suggests she, she does practice some sort of science. And we can also see uh, that she is researching the fungi that she has on her garden. Okay, so Nausicaa thus begins to enlarge her paradigm through scientific inquiry until she finally uncovers the mystery of the fuca in the scene where she falls under it. It turns out the toxic ecosystem is actually cleansing the world's water and soil, both key resources for the survival of the ordinary human world. This again is deduced by her through empirical observation and extrapolation. She already knows underground water and soil are toxic because she tested them in the botanical garden to grow the fuca's fungi. Now she discovers clean soil is actually petrified fungi trees smitten to dust and that those trees are filtering water underground. This way she deduces the role played by such ecosystem in the water cycle and the soil purification of her world. In this screenshot we can see Nausicaa under in this in this place under the fukai where she deduces the role played by this ecosystem as she sees that the water, air and soil there are pure. Through scientific inquiry, Nausicaa discovers that the extraordinary fuca is deeply entangled with the ordinary value of the wind, and so the laws organizing her ordinary world begin to encompass otherness by explaining it, by explaining its role in the larger scheme of things. This represents an epistemological, if not a total reconciliation. In any case, according to this brief analysis of the film, Nausicaa can be read as a narrative which deploys the textual system of the marvelous. Now, how can this help us to practice an eco-criticism of the film? Reading Nausicaa of the Battle of the Wind through Timothy Morton's Agrilogistics. According to the analysis of the textual system operating in the film's narrative, through her scientific inquiry, Nausicaa achieves this epistemological reconciliation between the Battle of the Wind and the Fukai, that is, between the ordinary and extraordinary, the human and the non-human worlds. In this case, Nausicaa is a sort of in this sense, Nausicaa is a sort of ecological messiah because she manages to reveal how these two worlds are interrelated ecologically. However, if we analyze the film through the concept of agrilogistics, something different shows up. For a philosopher Timothy Morton, what caused the split between the human and the non-human worlds was agriculture as originally practiced in ancient Mesopotamia. This started the reproduction of what he calls agrilogistics an algorithm that keeps self-repeating itself by reproducing agricultural space. In order to do so, agrilogistics' first step was the creation of an arbitrary division between itself, the human agricultural world, and everything else, the natural non-human world. Morton Doss understands agrilogistics as a self-repeating program, which is constantly, thoughtlessly, and violently creating otherness in order to keep on expanding towards it. In Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind, we can find an obviously agrilogistic space, which is the Valley of the Wind. Nevertheless, this dimension of the valley is deeper than it appears. Morton argues that agrilogistics creates a thin rigid boundary between the human agrilogistical social space and the non-human space. This can be seen in the valley. It is sealed from everything else and there is a thin rigid boundary that cannot be trespassed, because if anything does trespass it, the valley will be destroyed either by toxicity, war, or giant box. So it is not that the value of the wind is agrilogistics simply because it is pastoral, but also because it relies on the maintenance of this thin rigid boundary, something Nausicaa won't be able to conciliate because of the destructive power of toxicity, uh, because of the power toxicity has over the human world. The ordinary human world can materially assimilate the extraordinary non-human world. And thus, in this sense, the marvelous system doesn't, doesn't uh, unfold completely in the film. So here in this screenshot, we can see how the Valley of the Wind is isolated, surrounded by geographical barriers. And um, there is another barrier we cannot see, which would be behind the, the, the camera, to say it somehow. 
So it is, it is sealed, it is isolated. Nevertheless, toxicity in the film goes back in time. In the beginning of the narrative, it is revealed that a thousand years ago, there used to be an industrial civilization with highly advanced technology. The civilization polluted the world before being destroyed by an atomic resembling apocalyptic event, the seven days of fire. In this screenshot, we can see the giant warriors destroying the ancient civilization. So this toxicity was produced by an industrial civilization and this links the film to the concept of archaeologistics too. For Morton, industrial civilizations, as the ones we live in now, are an advanced expression of agrilogistics, advanced in the sense that the program has been running for too long. If we understand agrilogistics as this program, which is constantly and violently creating otherness, constantly maintaining the thin rigid boundary between itself and otherness, and deploying a series of tools to violently exterminate everything else, everything that doesn't fit into agrilogistic space, we can then connect it with Nausicaa's world pollution, extrapolating Morton's concepts to the fictional world of the film, we could say that this ancient industrial civilization's concentric temporality is still encompassing the events narrated in the movie, because in the end the pollution is still there. And such a toxicity was a consequence of the agrologistic program. It was and remains one of its tools of annihilation and self-reproduction, even though in the events of the film it happened a thousand years ago. So in the end, the agrilogistic program is still creating this division, maintaining the thin rigid boundary between agrilogistic human space and everything else. And this is something Nausicaa cannot fully solve because toxicity is simply too lethal to the human beings and their world. What she does achieve is an epistemological reconciliation between the two worlds in the sense that she discovers toxicity isn't an intrinsic part of the extraordinary world of the Fukai, but rather a reverberation of her past humanity, a trait, now a trait of the larger world, shared both by the human and the non-human alike, and which implies that these two worlds are, though radically separated, coexisting in some way. And now on to the conclusions. In Nausicaa, we can find the codification of an ordinary world in the Valley of the Wind, as well as its counterpart, the toxic ecosystem of the Fukai, codified as extraordinary in the film. This confrontation will be partly solved by Nausicaa as she discovers the Fukai purifies, purifies both water and soil through scientific inquiry, and thus she links it to the, to the survival of the human world. Up to this point, we have an epistemological reconciliation between both elements, the ordinary and the extraordinary. However, while analyzing the film through Morton's concept of agrilogistics, we find that in the end, such reconciliation is only epistemological and non-material. Uh, this is confirmed by the last scenes, the last scenes of the film, where we see the human forces which invaded the valley, as well as the almost stampede going back home, while the people of the valley begin rebuilding their normal world. These scenes reinforce the idea that the ordinary gets reestablished and both the humans and the non-humans return to their own spaces, remaining separated after all. This is because the human world simply can't fully coexist with its lethally toxic counterpart. We could thus say that Nausicaa doesn't really achieve the reconciliation between the ordinary and the extraordinary, between the human and the non-human, and in this sense, she isn't really the ecological messiah of her world. The synergic boundary between the human and the non-human remains in the end, and so does the agrilogistic program. This doesn't mean, however, that Nausicaa fails as an environmentalist movie. It does carry on a powerful message about how we can coexist with non-human beings precisely through the development of its protagonist, Nausicaa. It also remains a powerful parable of how empathy and ecological awareness can be achieved or enlarged by scientific inquiry and discovery. Nevertheless, the actual coexistence of humans and non-humans is in one same space remains a promise in the film, as it is suggested by the very last frame, but, uh, a belly of the wind leaf growing under the Fukai in the already purified world, as we can see in this screenshot. Okay, so this was my conference. I hope you find it interesting and I thank you very much for listening. I also want to thank the organizers 
for the the chance to present this in this conference thank you very much